Greetings all, and welcome to the third panel of the OECD Conference on Technology in and for Society. My name is Duncan Caspegs, and I'm the Head of Strategic Foresight at the OECD, where our role is to support and promote the use of foresight approaches to improve public policy work, both within and across the OECD and by governments and organizations around the world. So I'm delighted to be moderating today's panel on the topic of setting goals and agendas through foresight and participatory processes. Decisions around science and technology are some of the most important societal choices that humanity will need to make in the coming century. They involve significant risks and trade-offs and central values debates. At the extreme, certain areas of technological innovation have the potential to bring radical positive breakthroughs in our ability to improve the quality and duration of human lives and to address our most urgent global challenges. On the other hand, these same technologies could themselves pose new existential risks for humanity, such as the case of non-aligned artificial general intelligence or bio-risks. Society urgently needs the wisdom and strategic intelligence for informed collective decision-making about societal goals relating to science and technology and about how to translate these goals into decisions about the relative pace and direction of such developments. So as you know, a significant challenge to such decision-making is presented by the extremely rapid pace of change and high level of uncertainty that this generates. It's already extremely difficult to get a handle on the issues raised by technologies that exist today. Anticipating and preparing for the issues we could face in the coming years requires a whole further level of proactive effort. Strategic foresight and participatory approaches can provide an important part of the solution. And so let me start with a couple of brief rough definitions. By strategic foresight, we mean a structured approach to explore the future in order to inform decisions in the present. Recognizing the limits of prediction Foresight typically aims instead to identify and explore a diverse range of possible future disruptions and scenarios. This can help us to perceive emerging challenges and opportunities sooner than otherwise and design appropriate responses. It also helps us to stress test and future-proof our current and proposed strategies. And finally, it provides a broader understanding of the diversity of future possibilities from which we can design an aspirational vision or agenda of what we wish to achieve. Next, by participatory processes, we're referring to forms of engagement that are inclusive of multiple perspectives and interests, both within and across societies, and that also pay careful attention to the qualitative conditions required for a just and inclusive dialogue. So the purpose of this panel is to explore how foresight and participatory processes, or especially participatory foresight processes, can contribute to helping societies make wise and just decisions regarding their goals for future scientific and technological development. And we're very fortunate to have with us an excellent group of panelists to help us explore these issues. Our panelists bring a wealth of experience on the application of foresight and participatory processes to decision-making in a wide variety of settings. So allow me now to briefly introduce them all. First, we have Matthias Weber, head of the Center for Innovation Systems and Policy at the Austrian Institute of Technology. Edgar Peterse, uh, director of the African Center for Cities and the South African Research Chair in Urban Policy, University of Cape Town. Erika Wiergren, Chief Executive of We Imagine Europa, a think tank and ideas incubator based in Brussels. Aida Ponce del Castillo, Senior Researcher in the Foresight Unit at the European Trade Union Institute. And Sebastian Fortenhauer, Professor and Department Head at the Technical University of Munich. So I'd like to organize our discussion here in around two main questions, the, the why and then the how. So first, why do we need to need inclusive foresight processes on key scientific and technological issues? What problem does this solve? What is at stake? What examples are, are there of the issues where this is needed most and where we're failing by not building such approaches? And then in the second round, we'll come back to questions more about how do we do this? 
uh, how do we conduct inclusive foresight processes on key scientific and technological issues successfully? What are some of the requirements in terms of how to engage and who, and, and what are some of the pitfalls to avoid? So I'll begin by asking each of the speakers to first introduce themselves uh, and their role in this area, and then to start with this first why question. Why do we need inclusive science, uh, inclusive um, participatory foresight methods at this time? So uh, let me first turn to uh, you, Matthias. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Duncan, and thanks for inviting me uh, to this uh, panel discussion. Um, as you said, I'm working at AIT, the Austrian Institute of Technology in, in Vienna, which is Austria's largest applied research organization. And um, the role of our Center for Innovation Systems and Policy is actually very much to translate and interact between uh, science on the one hand and policy on the, on the other hand in terms and involving a range of stakeholders in that process. And for us, uh, foresight is exactly uh, the kind of um, mechanism in, in a way uh, in order to facilitate that kind of interaction process between these various uh, groups in society and to help design better, more future-proof policies in a way. And we've been doing this over many years now uh, from the European and international down to the local level in, 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 in a variety of different areas. Now to turn to your uh, first question, the, the, the why question, uh, as you put it, um, first of all, um, I think it is important to, to observe that foresight and strategic foresight have become more important over the past 10 years uh, in response to the recognition that uh, we somehow missed some of the very important um, breaks that we observed around the 2010s, the financial crisis, some of the Arab Spring developments, and some of the other disruptive developments at the time, which is why uh, foresight has become if you like, more important and, um, if you like, um, more, more relevant also for policymaking uh, again, I have to say. And in terms of the, 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 the biggest challenges that we are actually confronted with here also in relation to emerging technologies is the, is the issue of, the, of time and the fast pace of change that you've been alluding to. Because for our governance systems, this uh, represents a tremendous uh, challenge. Um, our governance systems tend to be not so well equipped for handling fast change processes. They're better equipped for handling slow change processes. And this means that there is not really the space for the necessary normative debates um, that um, emerging technologies would require. So um, we are always somehow running behind uh, the fast uh, pace of development. And uh, in a way, foresight is meant to provide the reflexive space uh, in order to become at least somewhat better in, in doing this. Um, we will come later on to the question of how this can be done, but this for me is really one of the biggest issues, why we need foresight and uh, why um, we need to have also um, uh, um, uh, participatory and inclusive forms of foresight. Because if we do not do that, and we, if we do not manage to open up this reflexive space in a timely fashion, we run the risk of ending up uh, again with technological determinism, which is actually not uh, what uh, we, are, we are aiming for, because, and this brings me to my second point of my introductory intervention, um, we, have, we have seen a quite important, what some people call a normative turn, also in innovation and industrial policy, where um, um, innovation is not regarded as a good per se, but it has acquired a, a very important normative and ethical dimension that was not so present in the past. And it is precisely for this reason that um, the kind of participatory and inclusive uh, forms of uh, foresight are so extremely important uh, nowadays, independently of whether we are talking about Missions, for instance, is one of the um, more recent developments in research and innovation policy or um, about um, other forms of fast change. Um, so these developments um, call for more inclusiveness in order to also take into account um, a greater diversity of perspectives and interests in relation to, to emerging technologies that are characterized by a high degree of, uh, of, ambival of ambivalence. Though we also need to recognize uh, 
that from this kind of more societal needs driven perspective on innovation, technology and emerging technologies are not the only inroads to providing better solutions, but where uh, social innovation and organizational change, also structural change in society may need to be equally considered. So I just wanted to pose these two main points and I will probably pick up on those in, in, in the later discussion. Super, thank you very much, Matthias. Um, next, uh, Aida, I'd like to turn to you uh, to discuss some of your work in strategic foresight around labor market issues, in particular from uh, a trade unions perspective. Well, my, my specific, thank you very much. I work at the European Trade Union Institute here in Brussels, Duncan. And uh, great to be here uh, speaking and discussing with you uh, in the panel. I do foresight or we practice foresight at ETUI. And what we do there is that we train uh, European trade unions from many sectors on how to do it. So the, the idea is to make uh, all the methodologies that the foresight process can bring accessible for trade unions. I think it's worth to say that foresight is not just useful for designing high-level policies and uh, designing and exploring technological innovation. When we teach how to use foresight, we do it in a way so that trade unions can use it to plan their own long-term strategies, but also to influence their policies at national level. And this has been um, quite useful because they have um, no noted the, the benefits of thinking large and in a long term. As you know, as any other government, trade unions also have a short men mandates. And this is a tool that enables to have a, a bigger and a wider lens and scope of for planning uh, their strategies. The benefit is that not only um, it's, it's a way to structure a future thinking or incorporating future thinking in a trade union movement, but also to involve other known actors, actors beyond employers, governments, and traditional uh, civil society organizations. And did this benefit, benefits is the, the scope of interaction among, among other publics, other values, and other interests is also wide. And uh, yeah, so this is more or less uh, just a very short introduction of my work, and I can show and explain more specific cases in the coming uh, uh, questions. Okay, that's great. And I think um, that's very valuable that you're pointing out that one of the additional benefits of foresight is not only is it a tool for bringing people's thinking into the future, but it is also lends itself to being an engagement tool for reaching out to other communities and other perspectives. Uh, it sort of can break, we often say in foresight that it can, by helping to break people out of their current assumptions and current perspectives, it creates a, a sort of new common space for thinking about the future. So with that, um, let me turn next to, to Edgar, uh, who, where you've been uh, conducting processes in a quite different context within uh, the city level in, in South Africa. Thank you, Duncan, and thanks also for the opportunity to be part of this panel. So I'm based at the University of Cape Town and I direct something called the African Center for Cities, which is an interdisciplinary hub located at the university, but also with a mandate to build Pan-African networks of research and teaching and training. Now, our context is that <clears throat> Africa is rapidly urbanizing. In fact, today there's more urban dwellers in Africa than there's in Europe, even though Africa is still largely perceived as a rural continent. Um, and the 600 million urban dwellers will increase to almost 1.5 billion over the next 30 years. And the challenge we face is that in this context, because the existing city is predominantly informal, because people work in the informal economy and they live in slum conditions, it also means that cities are largely unplanned. But the effect of that is that they are profoundly unequal. Now, what adds further complexity to this is that we've got a very youthful population. So the labor force will treble in the same window of time in the next 30 years. And since the majority of the current workers in our cities work in the informal economy, this is an incredibly daunting challenge. And then of course, you lay on top of that climate change impacts. And as we know from the IPCC modeling, uh, there'll be disproportionate impact and 80% of Africa's cities are in fact coastal. And so the combination of 
prolonged economic crisis, the impacts of climate change is inevitably going to spill over into all kinds of social conflict and possibly even violence, just given the histories that we're dealing with. Now, of course, the upshot of urbanization is that it gives you the benefits of agglomeration and it can accelerate economic development, innovation and inclusion. Our challenge is, is that we are going to lose out on that potential benefit if we don't manage this properly. So what we're trying to do is to say that we need to dramatically improve the evidence base to make sense of all of these trends and their complexity. And given the urgency of all of these pressures, it's important to build a kind of futures literacy. So within that context, um, specific methodologies, such as foresight in particular, and especially the versions of it that lends itself to more inclusive dialogue is really, really pertinent in the African context. And so to give you one example, we've got to make major choices about technology and infrastructure. If we take the global conversations, we can say the priority has got to be to decarbonize the mobility system. And that means figure out how soon can we get electrical, electric vehicles into our mobility systems? And how do we plan for that? What does that mean for road planning and so on? Whereas in reality, the issue is not so much electrification of the carbon cars, uh, combusted uh, engine cars, but it is how do we take the mode that most people use, which is informal mobility systems, such as motors, motorcycle scooters, and begin to see how do we start at that end. So it's a very different conversation, different entry point. And what we already see in East Africa, for example, is that what's called border borders, which is these one person scooter taxis, that they've synergized with digital finance tools and have created their own informal Uber-like platforms. And this is already introducing greater amounts of safety, but also the possibility in our financial instruments to support those informal workers. So that's one example. What we are trying to do is to see how can we use foresight tools to at multiple scales, create a futures literacy so that the planning is not narrowly just about how do we manage population, but rather how do we anticipate these trends and create the right decision-making processes to make the appropriate technological choices about infrastructure investments that is gonna in fact simultaneously deliver a productive platform, greater urban inclusion, and the possibility of a more sustainable human settlements. Um, so that's sort of uh, the domain that I work in. That's where we see the utility of these methods. But as I will explain later on, one of our biggest challenges are that we simply don't have enough of an institutional scaffolding to really mainstream this into various policy and planning processes about the future of African cities. Thanks, Duncan. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, both for the emphasis on the, the importance of broad-based futures literacy, but then also, which we'll come to, the, the broader scaffolding that this needs to be built upon. So. Okay, excellent. Well, with that, let me turn next to uh, Erica uh, for your perspective. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me to be here. So I run an organization called Reimagine Europa that, as the name suggests, was created to reimagine. And our starting point was really the recognition that with digital technologies, the whole world changed. Yet the, the system, so the, the way that we organize society and everything around that stayed very much the same including the way we think about the world. And this brought to the insight that we need to bring on board narratives and understanding how people think and frame issues as a key concept in all our work. And one of the key pillars we do work with is precisely new technologies and their impact. And um, the reason why we have as one of our key perspective that of, of really working with narratives and going beyond the existing narratives and outdated narratives is because the, you know, Wittgenstein used to say language disguises uh, thought, but it also says a lot about thought. And in this very polarized world where we, uh, that we live in, where science and technology are unfortunately often part of that polarized debate, if you look from the anti-vax movement to the science, to the climate skeptics, um, science is becoming a, a part of an identity politics. But if you actually look at what is being said, you can see that it often hasn't got very much to do about science at all, but is more about values and goals, as has been talked about a lot in these, uh, these two days. So the way that we approach this is really to start from saying, 
what do we understand from what people say? So we work, we have our uh, chief narrative scientist and our um, a contemporary mythologist scholar who help us actually decode not only what other people mean by what they say, but also the black box we live in in our own minds, because we all are, our minds are all shaped by our narratives and our circumstances. So we bring together, for instance, to give you an example, uh, in our task force on sustainable agriculture and innovation, where we talk, among other things, about things like genome editing, which is a highly polarized topic. Uh, what we see is that actually the debate is still stuck in the 90s, whilst the technology has obviously changed enormously. So we find ourselves having ideological debates about issues that maybe are not the, 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 the key point with the new technology that has arrived. So what we have done is on the one hand, we work with uh, leading experts from across Europe and the world with different perspectives. And then we bring in our chief science advisors and chief um, narrative scientists to help us decode what is it that we're actually saying when talking about this? So to go on another little detour, but um, we did an example on the anti-vax um, debate. And what we saw is that one of the main reasons why it's very difficult to have a conversation with people who believe something very different from you is not because the positions are very different. Actually, many of the goals are very similar. So for instance, you know, wanting to make a better world, wanting to, 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 to make work for society, support the little guy. But when it's framed in ideological issues, the debate never goes beyond this very um, key perspective. So for instance, in the anti-vax perspectives, we saw it wasn't about vaccines at all. It was about distrusting the elites or um, supporting economic things. And those are issues you can actually have a conversation about. These are really important issues for foresight to say, we want to ensure, I don't know, to support farmers or we want to have a fair economic system. So actually by working with narratives, we can actually understand better our own thought process and that of others and create a space for a better communication and conversation that can lead to much better foresight and better understanding of where it is we want to go. So this is what I want to talk about today. And I'm really looking forward to continuing this conversation with this uh, wonderful panel. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. And I think that makes us, uh, that definitely tweaks all of our interest in hearing more about just how one does this. But I'm, I'm taking away you know, a couple of points. First of all, what you said about you know, the ideas and the debates being stuck sometimes 20 years ago. And often we say one of the benefits of foresight is by getting people to imagine the future, you're actually just helping to update them to, the, to their understanding of realities today that may have shifted more than they've um, realized or taken on board. But also crucially, just your, your point about the importance of in that engagement of understanding the different perspectives, the different narratives that people bring to the table and finding how one can in some ways you know, supersede and get beyond the, uh, the, those divisions by, by identifying what the real questions are uh, that, they are, that are, are important to them. So um, that is wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, Sebastian, let me turn to you now. Thank you, Dan Duncan. Thank you, everyone, for the um, interesting points already. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Sebastian Fotenhauer. I am a professor of innovation research and um, at Technical University Munich, where I also head the Department for Science, Technology and Society. And I'm also leading a new, um, relatively new master's program called Responsibility in Science, Engineering and Technology. And so in a way, this is um, trying to take the conversation that we're having here um, into the realm of technical universities, sort of the hotbeds of innovation and sort of also speaking to the next generation of innovation leaders and how they might adjust to a changing sensibilities in this domain. So I briefly want to um, open up the discussion from my end um, with uh, three points. Um, one is has to do with the relationship between innovation policy and technology foresight slash governance. The second one has to do with the with new instruments and the third one with scale or scalability. And I think we can talk about all of them a little bit more later. Um, the first one, which I think is particularly interesting for a setting like this for at the OECD has to do with um, what I think is still a disconnect between the goals of innovation policy and the goals of technology governance or the goals of technology foresight. And what, what do I mean by that? So in a way, um, for the past decades, it's been, it's been quite common for policymakers to, on the one hand, call for more innovation in the name of economic competitiveness and growth, um, while at the same time treat um, governance um, uh, or foresight as a kind of separate issue or almost as an afterthought. And yesterday at the keynote by Sheila Jasanov, um, one of the things that she uh, suggested is that 
underlying this kind of dynamic or disconnect is still the idea of a sort of implicit social contract for science and innovation, where we think on the one hand that just doing more of it or putting more money into science and innovation is unequivocally good while seeing all the challenges that arise as kind of unintended consequences. And the problem with that is of course, that from a foresight and governance perspective, this has never been good advice and um, many of the issues could have been avoided. So luckily, some of the, I would say the policy zeitgeist is changing. Um, some of the biggest innovation debates that we've had, also innovation policy debates, um, had uh, in recent years have been around uh, governance of big tech, governance of algorithms, ideas such as the Green New Deal, and that somehow maybe it's not just about more innovation, but about better innovation and how do we get there. Um, so uh, I think uh, Matthias already pointed to the uh, to, in the direction that this that there is more there are more conversations on the horizon. Um, but the, the idea that somehow innovation policy and getting to more innovation should be separate from or is an, is an unambiguous uh, positive goal, this is, this is still dominant and we might be interested in how, looking how at a place like the OECD, we might actually bring opportunities like this to bear on questions of innovation metrics, questions of innovation policy and so on. The second point very briefly is that for that we need um, uh, new, new instruments that are more sensitive to real-time developments. And um, as Erica uh, just said, trying to understand specifically um, what exactly the meaning of certain um, policies or governances or technologies is in, in local settings. Um, some of the instruments that have been around the block for a while are things like public procurement or, real, uh, or living labs. And we can talk a little bit about the, the mecha mechanisms um, in a second. Uh, Matthias also mentioned missions that are kind of um, everywhere at the moment, but the, the question from a governance perspective then becomes um, if we take these instruments as ways of improving inclusiveness or participatory uh, perspectives on, uh, on technology governance innovation policy, are they doing enough or do we maybe have to rethink the purpose of these instruments um, in a slightly different way? So what does it really mean for missions to be inclusive or participatory? What does it mean for test beds or living labs um, as ways of testing really from a social perspective, whether we want a technology or not? Could, be, could the outcome be a negative, uh, a negative one saying there is something that we don't want? And all of these, uh, these things really cut at the heart of trying to, uh, trying to combine instruments that foster innovation with trying to with, uh, with, with instruments that make innovation more reflexive. And then finally, the third point, um, innovation and scale. So um, scale is kind of everywhere at the moment and it's perhaps most visible in the, in the conversations around big tech and platforms and entrepreneurship. But what does that, what do the dynamics of scaling and scalability have to do with um, questions of foresight and governance or our capacities that we have for that? and perhaps also for our capacity to engage in meaningful agenda setting and directionality. So are our tools for anticipation and governance um, really sufficient for an era of blitz scaling? And if we go beyond entrepreneurship and look at public policy, the similar sets of questions arise for, for example, missions or for how to scale up from living labs, kind of experimental setting or experimental economics. And are our tools sufficient? And I would say at the moment, they clearly aren't. Um, so they're not well equipped to deal with scalability dynamics. Um, and uh, the, uh, in a way, the, uh, we, we tend to put our anticipatory, uh, the, the split scale or the scalability dy dynamics tend to put our anticipatory capacity at a disadvantage, where the idea is that as long as it's scalable, uh, we, can, we can address this problem at a uh, grander scale, but maybe then we forego some of the, uh, the opportunities to really shape solutions um, in a kind of uh, re real-time manner. So how can we get to thinking about anticipation and, uh, and governance as a continuous process from sort of small scale to large scale? How can, how, what does this mean for the role of the private sector? So where, if, the, if scalability is driven by, let's say the Facebooks and Googles of the world, what does this mean for governance options? And can we maybe open up some of these scaling dynamics to more participatory processes?
Yeah, thank you very much. And um, for all three points, but I, I particularly want to pick up on your third one about scalability. Um, I, there's a huge amount of foresight that is being done by government, by businesses, by trade unions, as we've heard. And yet, I think they're probably fair to say there's a, an agreement here that it's nowhere near being done at the scale that we would need to really achieve this, this goal of a kind of wise and informed society making informed decisions about its its future and particularly around some of these questions raised by science and technology innovation and so it really it really raises the question for all of us of you know how can we grow the scale of this what are the the kind of partnerships the kind of mechanisms that would be required to still you know have the kind of quality of discussion that one can have in, in sort of small group workshops that we typically run and organize but really um, multiplying that uh, broadly out within you know across all parts of society and to a much greater scale so very interested to hear uh, what thoughts you have further on on how to achieve that and what others may may have also um so now that thanks thanks very much for that introductory round and now let's go to sort of the, the second round and, and delve in a little bit more and then we'll come back and open to questions from the audience so just a little reminder to all of you watching if you have questions please um put those up and we will uh, we will try to address some of those before the end of the session so um i guess that the question we now move into well is that the sort of how but i'd like to still focus a little bit first on on getting a little bit of a clearer sense of what are we really what's an example of a core issue here a, a core societal a fundamental debate issue that society needs to be grappling with around it, the future of science and technology and its its implementation and and how is it that foresight and participatory processes can really help address that i mean one could argue that a lot of these issues are already visible now and you know we don't actually need foresight to do them, and we and we could and we don't necessarily need participatory processes. We can get a bunch of experts off and just just look at these. And so what? And a lot of those that a lot of that's true. But what is the additional value added? What are the issues that really require us to take this more proactive foresight approach and proactively uh, inclusive as well? So so a little little bit more of a question around. You can give examples of that, and then and then your sense of of really how we can achieve that well. What are some of the, the elements of success that you've seen from processes you've been involved with? So I think I'll go with the, the same order again, which brings us uh, back to you, Matthias. Yes, thank you. I mean, there are of course a number of example areas, but the one that I always like most is probably uh, the debates associated with artificial intelligence and the wide range of application areas that it may be, um, uh, be, be used in and that have raised also many of the kind of uh, normative questions that we've been referring to before. Now, um, I think there have been a number of attempts and there are attempts going on of how to address these challenges related to emerging technologies like AI of trying to make foresight more real time, um, more responsive, uh, more rapid and adaptive in order to be able to keep pace with uh, the, 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 the fast developments that we can observe in, uh, in, in the field of AI. But the most fundamental problem here is really that um, there is um, often a lack of what I would call really imagination uh, of what this may bring up. I mean, before I was also at the sub panel on uh, neurotechnology, for instance, and um, there as well, it is very much about the kind of openness and uh, what um, Ika Tomi once called on ontological expansion. So we are really opening up entirely new worlds of how society and emerging technologies like AI interact and what kind of uh, if you like new spaces are opening up. And we have extreme difficulties to uh, look beyond that kind of, um, if you like, emerging development and imagine really how our world might look like. We have seen that in the past with the, with, with the emergence of the internet already. And I think with several of these emerging technologies that we are confronted with nowadays, be it in the kind of uh, more life science or in the IT realm, we are precisely facing the same problem. So this is really a very critical issue that what I would say is very important that, and it, it relates actually with what Sebastian has been referring to of bringing foresight and inclusive thinking and forward thinking 
into the education and training of uh, the next generation of scientists and engineers, namely this kind of futures literacy that we have often been referring to. I would actually tend to argue that doing that at the stage of the university is too late, and this is something that should be started much earlier in school training to develop the kind of skills of futures literacy um, that we are not teaching at that age where we are still training the kind of children to think in linear terms, which is not appropriate anymore. So um, when we are, we may be able uh, nowadays to the great difficulties to imagine what the kind of next black swans might be, but the key question is really to, to develop new approaches of what comes then after, after these kind of black swans have uh, come into being. And this is really one of the biggest challenges that we are confronted with um, in, uh, in, in this context. Another one is, pretty, is much, much better known, uh, which is I think about the embedding of foresight in decision-making processes um, and embedding it into organizations. Um, Aida was referring to that. I think Erica was referring to that as well. And uh, for instance, we have seen in some of the um, international organizations of the European Commission, this attempt of trying to make foresight more explicitly part of the decision-making processes or the preparation, the, the sense-making that is preceding the actual decision-making. So this is a kind of um, another very important um, element um, of where we have started to do some, make some progress, but where probably more is needed. And this applies actually to the various levels of, 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 of decision making. So I often like to refer to the Finnish example of the Committee of the Future, where we really have every four years a kind of very high level dialogue between the parliament and the prime minister's office that is spilling over into society to open up a dialogue in society of, uh, on the main future challenges that a, a country may be confronted with. And this kind of debate is, uh, I think, a quite good example of what can be done and uh, where also in relation to uh, emerging technologies and AI, we are still sometimes missing the uh, necessary fora. So one of the kind of suggestions that I think would be very, would be very useful is that whereas in, 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 the, in, the, in the context of um, what I saw uh, before, um, in the context of neurotechnology, there are these kind of global fora for, for discussing the emerging collective challenges in, 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 that, that are arising. Um, I, I think there is not yet such a forum um, at the, in, in relation to the variety of AI-related challenges that we are confronted with in the different areas of application. And a place where, for instance, the OECD could, I, could, I imagine, play a more prominent role in the future. In, 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 in the future. Mm, so um, maybe I'll stop here for now and leave uh, time for the others to add their thoughts. Super, thanks very much. And I, I do take two uh, important ideas about scaling there. One is to the education system. And I know there are initiatives uh, this, such as Peter Bishop's work in the United States on bringing foresight into the schools. But then also, um, you know, your citing of the, the, the Finnish case where not only do they have an internal to government foresight capacity, but they also, by having it in the parliament, it creates that bridge, as you said, with, with broader societal debates and, you know, across all parties. So that's, uh, that's another key point. Um, okay, thanks very much. Uh, so next we go to you, Aida. Thank you, Duncan. So um, for me, uh, a critical issue is for sure uh, the inequality gap. Mm -hmm. And with increased reliance on AI, just to follow the, the conversation, or it, it's also applicable to any digital technology, access to the digital world today means access to the real world. And lack of access, uh, whether it's due to insufficient infrastructure or skills, means an increased risk of social exclusion. And that for vulnerable groups, the long-term unemployed, the elder, elderly, persons with disabilities or the homeless, is the inability to benefit from much needed public services, from jobs opportunities, from technology, or information or from the technology itself. And this, this problem, this fundamental issue can then lead to deeper fundamental inequalities. And in a world driven more and more by, by digital technologies, the exercise of fundamental rights and, and digital rights become, becomes then super critical. 
So here I, I want to say, and just to rephrase also what Professor Jasenov reminded us yesterday, that we really need an inclusive world and we can make an inclusive world if we want. And, and she said something like not including society is simply not just an option. So um, in addressing technological innovation or assess, assessing technology and having um, foresight anticipatory capabilities, I think that uh, a, big, a big part of this process needs to imply or needs to address social implications in a wide scale. And uh, for that, of course, inclusive participation, I think it is very much needed and needs to happen also in a democratic way in which all the publics and voices and interests are truly represented. And here, uh, the opportunity is that uh, for national policies or regional policies, uh, this can be useful be because then they, they can be framed in, in a varied, uh, with a variety of, variety of citizens' perspectives. So uh, foresight has this capacity. It has the capacity to look at the long term, to have the capacity to look at the 360 degree of all the voices and, and look at who is participating and who might not be participating, and, uh, and also explore the wider implications and include the actors that, that need to shape this. So I, I think that um, the foresight can, can be embedded in our democratic processes in a more structured manner. We have seen already many examples uh, in, across the world, so I, I don't think why sh this should not be fostered. So all of this to say that uh, with this, I think that we can contribute to closing the inequality gap in many, many ways. And with this, I, I leave it back to you. Thank you. No, I, I think um, the inequality question is a hugely important one, which uh, Foresight has got a lot to offer to, you know, what does Foresight, what does inequality look like in a world of people interacting on the metaverse or in a world where one can uh, convert economic inequality into biological inequalities through human augmentation or in the world of, you know, this um, very, very high, uh, well, changes in the labor market, which I'm sure many of you are working on. Uh, so, I mean, this is, this is a, a crucial one where we can see a lot of the issues on the radar already. We can see them now today, and yet to be getting ahead of it in policymaking, we need to be kind of looking at some of the, the future scenarios and what new uh, elements of the inequality question it could be raising. So thank you for that one. Um, I'd actually wanna jump in now. There's a question from the audience uh, that I think I'm gonna raise with you right now, which is if you could give a few more details on how you, you go about training trade unions to use foresight, what kinds of activities do you actually put in place? You know, speak to that briefly. Yes, very briefly, and thank you for the question. So we are a research and also a training and education institute in Brussels. And with the education department, we have designed two types of trainings for trade unionists. One on the types of methodologies that they can use in order to make a foresight project for their own organization or for specific concern or topic that they would like to develop in this strategic foresight uh, frame. And here, the idea is that we teach uh, what, what a strategic foresight project looks like, St scanning the horizon, using the methodology of looking at the mega trends and how to analyze them, how to bring that in a whole, um, in a comprehensive horizon scanning of the, difficult, of the different aspects that they are looking at, how to frame a question with a long-term perspective long-term really uh, beyond 20 years so that they can see the future with a very long lens and then applying it to their processes either by uh, having a clear roadmap, a technology, the methodology of technological roadmap can be perfectly applied to any social mission-driven organization and also backcasting. And, uh, and of course, this uh, will allow them to, to have a clear vision. Now, for, what is important here, what we are doing at ETUI is that we are adapting foresight methodologies that sometimes can be very quantitative in a more qualitative manner, because we are not putting a technology in a marketplace and we're not selling any product. Uh, the ETUI works with trade unions and trade unions are mission-driven organizations. 
But in any case, they, they benefit from applying foresight in their own way and making their mission and vision uh, sustainable and refresh it because um, this is what is exactly the core of their business, so to speak. So this is what we do. And then we have another training, which is very much targeted to trade union leaders, those at the head of national trade unions that are deciding the paths of what uh, of that organization. And this is very much political and, and, and economical and, and financial, as you can imagine, because trade union leaders need to negotiate at, uh, at the very different levels with the government, with employers, with other organizations at the national, but also at the international level. And here, what we teach is uh, with the education department, we do this uh, together with our, my colleagues there, is how to, to shape uh, the minds of a trade union leader in order to be more anticipatory. Mm -hmm. And we train them, we use the metaphor of uh, contemporary art. <laughs> contemporary art, we can make a whole conference about this, it's a great tool to, to for example, bridge what Erica was trying to explain, bridge those narratives and the specific subject of study. And without really, really uh, getting into um, difficult conversations. So we observe a problem through the lens of contemporary art, which is of course artistic and beautiful, and which allows for many perspectives, senses, and uh, ways to, to look at the same problem um, and allowing creativity and innovation to flow out of the brains of the trade union leaders. So this is more or less what, what we do with our training courses at TUI. Thanks so much, Aida. Um, I'm clearly this kind of training and outreach, but also exploring new media such as um, contemporary arts would be a key component of this goal of really scaling up. So thank you, very useful. Um, okay, let me go to you next, Edgar. Sure, thank you, <clears throat> Duncan and colleagues. This is a fantastic discussion and very stimulating. Um, I'm gonna, I think I, I'd sort of just to to keep the sort of geographical inclusivity of the conversation. I kind of want to just reset some of the assumptions because I think a lot of what uh, both Matthias and Sebastian were referencing as absolutely critical debates, they do assume either a national or a regional scale of regulation, or at least of thinking about how society intermediates on these questions. And I fully agree with that, but for me, and certainly from the entry point that I explained earlier, they, and this comes back to our question of scale that we're wrestling with in this conversation as well. Uh, we do need to have these capabilities at multiple scales. And I, I don't think that that's sort of what's the mechanics of that? How do we enable that, that we're paying sufficient attention to that? And I would argue that this is particularly urgent in the realm of managing this massive demographic transition we are witnessing in the African context. So what is at stake here? One is we've got to figure out, so 80%, right, of the built environment has not yet been constructed in the African context that needs to be built in order to meet the basic socioeconomic rights of urban dwellers. And that has to be done within the next 30 years. That's the same horizon within which we've got to become net zero societies. So how are we going to decarbonize and dematerialize the metabolic systems of our urban infrastructures, obviously digital technologies will be critical, one critical aspect in it, but to treat it as a technocratic question would be so utterly misplaced because it is not as if people who don't have access to basic services today are sitting on their hands. They are hustling 24 seven through their own social institutions and their own mechanisms of delivery and service provision and so on. And if our future policies don't understand those dynamics and work off them to build new hybrid solutions, that's the innovation bit, is taking tacit knowledge and taking technological breakthroughs and developing solutions that are culturally embedded, politically viable, and that can be funded. Those are the four side questions. So just to give one very practical example, if we take the criteria meeting basic needs, decarbonize, dematerialize, and we have to, at the same time, 
generate new economic opportunities to meet the jobs goal, for every investment decision made, whether it's mobility, whether it's energy, whether it's waste, whatever it might be, you can think of a very simplistic two by two, right? So on the one axis, you would have universal access to that infrastructure, or you would have sectional access, which is the elites. The other axis would be affordability. In other words, everyone can afford to access that service and exclusivity. So if we can use foresight, and that's a very simplistic two by two, but just to sort of demonstrate the kind of processes that would be required to plot what are the choices we have? How do we justify that politically, ideologically? How do we justify that in many terms? Now, the point that I want to make is that if you don't have at the urban scale, where those decisions need to be made, where the compacts have to be built, that if we are gonna go for nature-based solutions to manage water systems, if you don't have the institutional backbone in terms of science and technology and innovation at the urban scale, you simply cannot have the policy conversation in the first place because you don't have the level of nuance and contextual knowledge to curate the conversation to make sure that you bring together the evidence, you're able to incorporate the narrative components as was explained earlier, but you can then also have the hard nosed negotiations to make decisions about what gets prioritized and by when and who's gonna be held accountable. So I think that this issue of informed decision-making accountability is kind of maybe a theme we haven't yet picked up. And for me is really important to give credibility to these foresight systems. Because if it doesn't facilitate more inclusive and informed political praxis, you're not gonna get accountability. And that's for me, the missing currency in our policy discourses. So what we see across the continent at the moment is a massive uptake of all the global discourses, whether it's resilience, smart cities, mission-driven thinking, you name it, it gets incorporated, but it fulfills a performative function. It gives the impression that politicians and senior managers are busy with the right global questions whilst absolutely nothing changes in the back office, right? And that's what we've got to break. And that's the danger a little bit of some of these discourses. So I've got more to say, but I'll end there. Um, but I've been really animated by, um, I think, the really sort of critical way in which uh, this possibility is being problematized today because I absolutely believe we need the infrastructures, but we should be engaging it with our eyes wide open about the political economy constraints we face to indeed use foresight to arrive at more just and inclusive outcomes as the participatory part of your framing, Duncan. Thanks. Yeah. No, thanks. Thanks very much. And I, I take a couple of really important points. First, about the, the non-technocratic nature of the decisions that need to be made. There are technocratic decisions, but these are crucially uh, important societal and political discussions that they themselves need to be informed by futures thinking. But also your point about the scale of the, the levels here. This, this needs to be done massively at the urban scale because that is where that's the the, the front lines of a um, huge amount of decisions particularly around the implementation of, of technologies and uh, and new infrastructures and so i guess the question it raises and maybe you can come back to it in, in the final comments in a few minutes is uh, around this issue of how do we scale this up what are the kind of ways that we could support as a global community the provide the tools and mechanisms and even initial um, heavy lifting around potential changes in the global context that can then be provided uh, as useful ingredients of, for cities to be conducting their own participatory foresight approaches, while at the same time avoiding the risk that, you know, if we're providing these from a global level, that they're, they're including some of these biases, which then, as you, you uh, mentioned, you know, or, or discourses that can then just sort of have a take on a, a performative role rather than really being embedded in, in the local discussions or reflecting the genuinely local discussions. So how do we, how do we get that kind of balance right? I'm going to um, turn to, to Erica and Sebastian in one second. I'm just mindful of the time. I'm going to read out a couple of the questions, which I think we're beginning to already touch on, but uh, may also be relevant. Uh, I think they're very highly relevant to what Erica was saying. Um, so the first similar ones, but could we get our views on futures foresight adopting a more responsible stance on the sense of being underlined by values of care, stewardship, social welfare, and sustainability? And the next one is, 
how can we avoid participatory processes for foresight being biased by sectoral, political, and economic interests? So this is sort of getting a little bit into what are the underlying power relations and, and narratives, uh, which I know is very much your space, uh, Erica, but, uh, but <laughs> feel free to answer those questions or, or, or the previous ones that you are. Um, go, so go right ahead. Well, thank you. And it's it's really super interesting, this debate. And I'm sorry we couldn't all be in Paris at the moment and continue the debate over coffee um, afterwards. But there's so many points I'd like to make, but I'd like to agree with what Sebastian said in the beginning. And that is that the concept that research and innovation is a good in itself and always is seen as a positive thing, that time has passed. And I think the whole perspective now is really science and technology will have to show why it's so important and their foresight has a crucial role to play, especially now. And I think this is what we see as the biggest concern for science and technology right now is that the anti-scientific movement has grown drastically during the past pandemic. I mean, it's been, I'm talking for Europe now, but I, I think there are similar trends across the world gone from a very minority one under one percent vocal group until nearly a 20 percent who admit that they are anti-science in some way or or another and this is then you usually have another 20 percent who are latent or who won't accept but are skeptic and this is a huge challenge for science and technology and it's grown so rapidly so I think this will be the number one issue that we will have to be facing, whether it's AI, uh, biotech, um, or, or any other big uh, technology that is coming. And here, I think that what Aida was mentioning before, which is the inclusivity, is a core point that needs to be taken on board, and where I think it's not only about including people in official settings, which yes, are important to have these technical setups, but really also to make them feel part of the broader conversation. What we're feeling a lot is that often there is a sense from, from a technocratic or maybe a scientific perspective of sometimes saying, oh, but we're right. You have narratives and we have facts. And that already starts off a debate which is not very productive and, and, and quite insulting for a lot of people who know the fact. It's not that they don't know the facts, they just disagree on how to analyze the fact. But the positive thing on that and what we have seen in doing work on, for instance, genome editing, that once you start deciphering and once you start um, kind of translating each other's visions, but also and the values behind that. And I think that's the core point and showing that actually, usually you have very similar goals, you want the same things you want, you've just analyzed things differently, you can start a different conversation and not a conversation based on I'm trying to convince you that my point is right, but a conversation of saying, Oh, I hadn't thought about it in that way. And this is really interesting, because we have so much research showing that, uh, you know, uh, working in, in groups, um, and 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 um, group intelligence and these kind of things bring out so much better results than if you're working with like-minded people. So actually, by opening up these conversations, we can start a, a extremely different conversation that can lead to better foresight, that can be more inclusive, that can keep in mind many things that maybe are on a different perspective. And this is even more interesting if we think about it not only from different communities within a region, but at a global level, because I'm sure, Edgar, that your perspectives are quite different from, from some of, of, of my communities, but they're all equally valid. And that's what I think is really interesting. If we're opening up to that, um, this would be a, a, an extraordinary capacity for foresight that would also make people feel inclusive included in it and the wonderful thing is that ideas are the most powerful uh, performer for change that humans have it's through stories that we change society so if we have a good story that is shared by many communities even though we're we're you know developing it in smaller groups and having smaller conversations it will catch on and it will change the way people think really quickly and we can see that for instance with how quickly the anti-science move has changed in the past two years ideas spread very quickly when they are felt as useful and valid. So if we can bring this in into the core of how we do foresight, so we're starting from not trying to convince some people that our perspective is right, but open up to a real conversation about how do we actually think about this? What are the values that are important to different communities? I think that can be a game changer for how science and technology are perceived and that they can take up the real place in this debate as real um, factors for change and that can allow us to deal with the biggest challenges that we have. So that would be my point. Very well put, thank you so much. Um, Sebastian. <laughs> 
This is an extremely interesting discussion. Um, I, I, there's so much to say and you now the challenge as always is um, what, what do we have the time to say? And so I wanted to pick up on the question um, that was asked from the audience about the relationship between foresight and sort of values of care, stewardship, social welfare and sustainability and maybe also tie this back to um, opportunities for the OECD in this particular setting to be responsive to these kinds of concerns. And uh, maybe the first thing to say here is um, to just underscore what Edgar um, reminded us. And I think the first thing to keep in mind is a certain context sensitivity for the social, political, economic settings um, where we try to address these challenges, how this relates to global inequalities and how we tend towards navel gazing. And the first, really the first thing there is that question of stewardship and social welfare and sustainability look very differently depending on where you ask them from. Um, and uh, for um, one of the first, let's say, mission-oriented type of policies that have become, had had some traction maybe um, in Europe and beyond was the, maybe the German energie vendor or energy transition. But one of the ch fundamental challenges with that one was that it was primarily designed as a national policy initiative, whereas questions of energy transitions are global in nature, um, uh, climate policy and infrastructural questions are global in, in, many, in many different ways. And now we're seeing sort of a rehash of some of this navel gazing. Um, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, commission president at COP26 uh, suggested or uh, COP was strongly committed to innovation missions, which face value is a good thing, but uh, what does it mean then we want to uh, that we want to have 100 climate neutral cities in Europe um, uh, at who, uh, what, the, how does this fit into a global context? Is there actually agreement within Europe what climate neutral should mean in terms of consequences? How can we, uh, I mean, where do, it, where do we derive this mission from? How is there an inclusive way of arriving at a mission statement like this? Would people, if we take the experiences with COVID seriously about eradicating the COVID pandemic, is there actually a basis for believing that? Um, uh, that people would agree on the means and, and on the tools and on the role of technology and science as part of find, trying to find a solution. And um, there's reason to be skeptical, but there's also a reason to be optimistic, uh, perhaps in terms of fostering a more global conversation. And the OECD might be one of the places where we have a privileged opportunity to take these responsibilities seriously, um, where, uh, where we can relate national policy agendas to one another, where we can foster cross-cutting conversations about uh, differences and about context sensitivity, and where we can provide um, opportunities or platforms to learn. And um, it might be, I mean, for me, this whole conversation here today speaks really to a, a, a sort of a shift where it's, where, where, where also organizations like the OECD are moving away from sort of, uh, I guess, just providing the statistics to, uh, to providing Serious, serious uh, opportunities for engagement with the normative concerns that these statistics, for example, indicators beget and so on. And so maybe one final thought on the question of scale, again, because it has been coming up and scale is sort of a double-edged sword as well. Uh, we talked about how scalability dynamics might preempt or shape questions of op opportunities for participation. Um, and on conversely, I think Duncan reminded us earlier that we uh, that scalability might also be something that we want to consider for participatory exercises. So I, uh, how can we scale up opportunities for meaningful engagement? I led a European research project at some point called um, scaling up co-creation um, question mark. And the uh, one of the lessons and this again goes back to Edgar's point Edgar's point. Um, is that uh, it's really hard to make sense of participatory formats across contexts. And so one of, one of the, so a participatory process that might lead to a desirable outcome in Germany um, is almost guaranteed to fail in another context. Um, and the kind of results that we produce are not, uh, don't travel, uh, that we produce through participatory processes might also face challenges and travel, uh, traveling um, elsewhere as well. So for me, there's an opportunity to take seriously the differential impact of participatory exercises as part of foresight across different countries and come to a kind of, um, uh, I guess, 
understanding of, per, of continuous learning between different settings, between different countries, um, for example, at the OECD, to see what the limits and what the opportunities or avenues for participation for it can really be. Yeah, uh, thank you, Thax, for tying together. I mean, we've talked about the need to strengthen futures literacy and, and foresight um, at the local level, uh, you know, within various organizations. And yet you're also talking about the importance of, of having that kind of global dialogue about the future. I believe one of the panels yesterday was was calling for, you know, the OECD playing a role in this sort of building a long term strategy. But maybe it's really about building the, the sort of capacity to have dialogue and exploring future possibilities um, is, is also a role that, the, that we collectively can play in this space. Um, so down to the final wire here, I, I would love to ask each of you to give um, up to a minute of a final thought, uh, both regards to, you know, what's your key takeaway, but any other key advice that you've got for the OECD in terms of our role, but with apologies that it's going to need to be uh, really quick, I will give the, uh, the last words over to each of you. So let's uh, keep in the same order for simplicity. Uh, Matthias, back to you. Yes, thank you, Duncan. Well, um, if there was one thing that I really take away from this discussion, it was really inspiring, and it is really the emphasis on a more time and process based view on what uh, foresight uh, can uh, deliver to our uh, debates about dealing more inclusively with uh, emerging technologies and with the kind of social changes that we are facing. This has to do with this issue of, face, of, pay, of pace and the speed of change. It has to do with the scalability dimension that uh, Sebastian stressed a couple of times. It has also to do with this kind of more long-term view on societal challenges, where this fits very well in. And it has also to do with this kind of context specificity. So this is why, uh, if you like, this issue of time and process-based view, rather than understanding foresight as a kind of one-off activity, rather see it as a kind of integral part of the change processes that we need to engage with and where a variety of stakeholders um, under different circumstances in their respective context need to be brought on board. So this is for me in a way the kind of main takeaway yeah. and uh, I, I actually have think have to that cut you off there. Thanks. Yeah, sorry. Thanks so much Matthias but absolutely agree foresight has to be an ongoing process. Aida. Thank you, Duncan. And the one thing uh, I would like to share is genuine inclusion. So it has to do with people, real people, individuals, human beings. This is all about humans. And I think that OECD short-term policies need to design and, and, and build inclusive and participatory processes. And these policies can and need to enable civil society to become agents of technological transformation and other transformations and just opened to genuine societal contribution as opposed to a limited approach. So uh, really having this uh, capability to have and accept uh, and collect the views could be my one, one message uh, for all of us. Thank you. Super, thanks so much. Edgar. Sure, I'll be predictable. Um, <laughs> so I think, um, I, I think the OECD has to step into a stronger advocacy role and take on its, 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 its most powerful members and call out the um, extreme hypocrisy around the Global Climate Fund, around the sort of lack of waiving TRIPS agreements in terms of the pandemic at the moment. I mean, these are emblematic of a much more structural problem where there is simply not the level of global solidarity translated into funding that is needed to deal with these big questions. So we can foresight until we're blue in the face, but if the majority of the world's population doesn't actually have the institutions and the infrastructures and the resources to solve their own problems, we're pretty much all doomed as we can see, um, you know, with the, with the virulence of, of the mutations of the COVID virus. So yeah, so that's my takeaway, thanks. Thank you, I asked you all to be frank and provocative and thank you, that's super. Um, Erica. In a highly fragmented world, I think we need to use and work with narratives in order to create a de depolarized or support a depolarization on science and technology because they're too important for the future. And we have to remember that if we work against narratives, we're rowing upstream. We're going to make a, take, make a lot of effort and not come anywhere. But if we work with narratives, we're going to go downstream. And that will be a much more um, efficient way. So let's bring narratives in and use the work of 
people like Professor Manuel Castells, Professor Antonio Damasio, George Lakoff, Daniel Kahneman, and all these brilliant thinkers uh, within our foresight site system. So let's use the social sciences in order to support science and technology spreading globally. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, yes, so I guess my takeaway is um, there seems to be a strong sense that simply more of the same and maybe even more innovation is not the answer, but better innovation might be the answer. And for that, we need new policy instruments and better sense, uh, a better understanding of what better actually means, depending on where you're looking from. The OECD and maybe particularly also the, the, the working party of um, biotech, nanotech, converging technologies is really, for me, breaking quite new ground for the OECD by trying to link innovation policy with tech governance and foresight. And so with questions of directionality, and I would just say more of that direction is extremely welcome um, because it opens up spaces for more inclusive discussions. Okay. Well, with a huge thank you to all of you, I think we've really set up the next session well, but we've really addressed how foresight and participatory processes can be useful to, or in fact, essential to uh, effective thinking about the future, setting the agenda for in science and technology. And, uh, and really, uh, just a huge thank you to all of you as panelists. Uh, this is just scratching the surface. I hope it will be an ongoing conversation. And thank you all in the, in the audience as well. And we look forward to an ongoing discussion around these very crucial issues. Thanks a lot. <laughs>